So let's talk a little bit about Starlink. As you may know, SpaceX has been launching rockets and has created a successful business uh, making money doing that. Uh, however, they also are, have some pretty ambitious plans of uh, going to Mars. Uh, they are currently in process of building uh, one non-orbital test uh, of their new Starship uh, out in Texas. Um, it's got a new engine configuration called the Raptor, which is a little bit different than the Merlin engine that's on their current Dragon, or I'm sorry, their current Falcon rockets. Um, but anyway, they also have a, a larger orbital class test vehicle they're building in Texas, and uh, word came out this week that they're starting to build one here in Florida as well. Uh, where this comes into play, though, is obviously research and development uh, costs money. And right now their uh, margins on rockets is good. However, they're also selling them pretty cheap. Uh, and so they need a little bit more source of an income for the rocket side of things, for the R&D for the future. So one of the things that they've been talking about as a source of income is working on a global satellite um, based internet service. Now, some of you may be thinking, hey, they're not the first ones to do that, uh, whether it's HughesNet or some of the other uh, options in partnership with uh, DISH or DirecTV. There are other satellite internet providers. However, frankly, most of them are pretty useless. Um, the two biggest downsides are the amount of bandwidth that's available is very low, um, and also the latency is incredibly high. So anything that needs any sort of real-time communication is pretty much out the window. Um, whether that be something as simple as voice over IP, um, any sort of LTE over Wi-Fi, uh, or other things like online gaming, your ping times are in the hundreds of milliseconds. Um, reason for that is most of those satellites are based way out in, um, in geostationary orbit. Um, meaning that the satellite is at roughly the same place in the sky relative to your point on the ground. That makes it easy for satellite purposes uh, because most consumers would have a dish uh, located you know, somewhere on their house apartment on their property that is pointing to a fairly specific um, place in the sky because they know that that's roughly where the satellite is orbiting. However, in order to maintain a fixed place in the sky, you have to be pretty far away from the Earth. Um, don't remember the exact number, but it's something like you know 15,000 kilometers away. So it works well from being able to keep a, a geostationary uh, location. Uh, however, um, it doesn't work so well uh, because of the distance. So. There have been a few other companies that have tried. So far, none have succeeded or even gotten anywhere with any real distance um, to provide low Earth orbit, um, somewhere in the you know closer to 500 to 700 kilometer range. Um, the upside to that is obviously your uh, latency is significantly less, uh, on the order of uh, an order of magnitude less. So instead of talking hundreds of uh, milliseconds, you're talking tens of milliseconds. The downside, or the biggest downside, is it, you can't have a, a geostationary orbit quite that close to the Earth. And so what you would end up doing is having multiple uh, non-stationary orbits that then, from a tracking standpoint, uh, you can't have a single dish pointed at a single point in the sky. Um, you would have to have something looking, you know, maybe not quite 180 degrees, but say 45 or 90 degree uh, portion of the sky and there will be mul multiple satellites that pass in and out uh, of that uh, of that cone if you want to think of it that way so from the client end that becomes a lot more uh, complicated because you have to know where the satellites are be able to track them and then be able to have seamless handoffs between the various satellites that you're talking to one of the other upsides is, uh, in addition to the latency, is you can have significantly higher bandwidth. Um, the main reason for that is rather than having, say, two or three satellites that cover the entire you know, uh, United States 
continental United States, you could have potentially two to three hundred that are covering that same area. So the bandwidth isn't spread anywhere near as far. So all that to say, uh, SpaceX is working on de deploying uh, this type of satellite infrastructure. Um, the term they're calling it is Starlink. Um, their intent is to have thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit, somewhere between five to seven hundred kilometers uh, above the Earth. And they're uh, estimating that they have uh, will have potentially a million users on the ground um, that are able to have uh, a client service talking to those satellites. Right now, they're just in the uh, development phase. Uh, a couple years ago, they had two satellites uh, go up. They were called Tintin A and Tintin B, and they were prototypes. Uh, they piggybacked on top of a, a main communication satellite. I don't remember which one off the top of my head. Um, but they've been up there for a little bit, um, and SpaceX has been playing with, with them. Um, they haven't really released any details. Uh, but in 2019 was supposed to be the year where they would launch a, uh, a full, basically a full version one uh, of their uh, communication hardware. And rather than try and piggyback these, uh, what they've decided to do is just do dedicated launches. Now, normally with a big satellite, um, you can fit uh, two if it's small to medium size or, or sometimes just one uh, satellite inside uh, the fairing that... Uh, sits on top of the rocket. A couple reasons for that. Again, if you're not going to a low Earth orbit, um, it takes a significant uh, amount of energy to propel something uh, to uh, further orbit. Uh, not, not away from the Earth. It's something like half the amount of mass, uh, given the same amount of uh, rocketry. Um, you can get about half the amount, amount of mass to a geostationary transfer orbit than you can to low Earth orbit. Um, and secondly, you they tend to be much physically larger. Um, you know, a larger dish to be able to receive signals from the Earth, uh, better instrumentation, um, more uh, onboard fuel for being able to do station keeping, stuff like that. And so most of the communication satellites you see go up are fairly large. What SpaceX is doing is uh, they're developing fairly small satellites. And because they own the rockets, uh, they have they know exactly what the capabilities are, um, both for the rocket, but also they know uh, more, more specifically what some of the dimensions are, center of mass, uh, all that kind of stuff. So they can tweak both the rocket itself, but also the design and shape of the individual satellites to perfectly fit uh, and maximize the amount of space uh, inside the rocket fairing. Um, just for a matter of perspective, the rocket fairing is, I believe, five meters in diameter uh, and somewhere around, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, 20 meters uh, in length. And so you've got a, a pretty good amount of space there. Um, and so what they've done is they found a way to origami not one or two, but 60 satellites uh, inside their fairing. Um, this was scheduled to launch last night. Um, it actually got delayed by a little bit, so it's uh, scheduled to launch tonight at 10:30 uh, p.m. That would be Thursday, uh, whatever the day is today, what, the 16th of May, 2019. And so they're scheduled to go ahead and launch that one uh, tonight. Um, as you probably know, SpaceX also has a, a knack for landing their rockets after they've uh, launched; they can reuse them. Um, in fact, this rocket has already been used twice, this specific booster that will be flying. Um, and it will be landing, again, on their uh, ship they use for any non-land-based uh, returns. Um, and that ship is sitting somewhere off the coast of North Carolina. It's about uh, 680 kilometers uh, away from Cape Canaveral here in Florida. So and uh, this will be their heaviest uh, payload they've ever launched. Um, even including the ones that uh, went up on the Falcon Heavy. Um, now, because this is going to low Earth orbit, they can trade off a little bit on some of the, the fuel uh, for getting a slightly heavier payload. It doesn't need to be going quite as fast. Um, it's about, what, 26,000 kilometers per hour is what uh, orbital velocity is. 
for low earth orbit and uh, so they're scheduled to launch uh, after it goes up um, they have a an interesting idea on how they're going to deploy the satellites um, basically over the course of I think they said an hour uh, they're going to take the second stage and actually rotate it like a rotisserie and they're going to be ejecting the individual satellites so they'll kind of go off in different directions um, after the rotation you know kind of gives it a little bit of centripetal force or centrifugal whatever I can never pronounce that one um, and so they're going to be deploying the all 60 satellites <laughs> an interesting comment that Elon made yesterday was that there's a good chance that some of the satellites may bump into each other uh, after they're deployed and he said don't worry that's intentional and they're made to handle that um, which leads me to believe that they're not necessarily all 60 going to be operational but it'll be very interesting to see uh, you know it's kind of neat i think this is other than uh, maybe the some of the tests that they've done some of the prototype launches like the the falcon heavy one uh, the demonstration mission last year uh, where Elon launched one of his roadsters uh, in a uh, orbit that was roughly equidistant or um, the furthest distance of Mars. It wasn't quite going to Mars, but it had a, is it a perigee of the a Mars distance from the sun? Anyway, and an apogee of Earth distance. Uh, but anyway, so the, the intent is to be able to launch that one um, and one thing that I think is really cool is that they've been able to completely design, you know, if you want to think of it from a vertical integration standpoint, um, they're basically controlling everything from the rocket to the launch to the payload to the fairing. Uh, everything about it is, is in-house. Um, obviously, their cost to do that is significantly less than if they'd outsourced. Um, they haven't given any real numbers as to what the cost of the satellites are. Uh, other than to say that it's less than the cost of the rocket, um, which they don't really give prices as to what the, those are, but if I had to make up a number, um, which I'm going to, um, I'd guess you know it's going to cost them anywhere around $30 million for the launch and maybe another $20 million for uh, for manufacturing and, and set up and all that of the individual uh, satellites, so the payload. Again, I, I could be way off, plus or minus 50%. Let's put some uh, error bars on there. And so that's uh, that's the plan for tonight. Um, where I think is really interesting is this is something, you know, it, a, it's sort of hard to get a feel for how, say, a, a random communication satellite that goes up, it's hard to get a feel for how that could impact you in your day-to-day -day life. Um, you know, maybe if you're someone that uses a, a satellite phone maybe for work, then seen some of the iridium uh, satellite launches okay that could be kind of cool um, you know because you know you know you may one day be talking to uh, to one of those that launched uh, using your uh, your handheld phone um, which by the way I should make a caveat uh, iridium does have low earth orbit satellites and they are able to have a a data connection uh, it's pretty weak uh, last time I used it it was in the, the tens of kilobits per second um, I mean that was 20 something years ago uh, so they're significantly faster now but they're nowhere near what most users would consider broadband so it's not a, a viable alternative for anything other than you know low data uh, volume telemetry type things um, you know just a uh, location ping stuff like that maybe for for planes or ships or something like that. You're not going to be uh, streaming YouTube on that type of connection. Um, let's see, another, some of the other interesting data points uh, that were mentioned in the press conference yesterday. They're estimating that it'll be about 1,200 satellites um, before there's very good coverage uh, on the Earth. Um, you know, they're looking at I think it's from about 20 degrees, um, or I guess it'd be what 100 degrees off the equator to 100 degrees below the equator. So you call it uh, Middle Canada down to Middle Argentina, uh, somewhere anywhere in that band should be serviced by uh, by these satellites that are orbiting. Uh, unfortunately, they're probably not going to do too well covering some of the uh, polar type uh, type orbits. 
just because of the nature of how the orbits are. Uh, it's, it's about similar to what the space station coverage is, uh, which is what, a 41 degree inclination orbit, uh, something like that. Um, anyway, um, let's see, the uh, Elon said that they're estimating about one terabit of uh, overall throughput for the 60 that are launching tonight. Um, so even if that was covering, you know, a million users, um, that would still be, what, one kbps that they'd be able to maintain? Is that right? No, that'd be a mega person. Yeah, a meg per at a time. So, you know, that definitely gets you a lot better than, say, dial-up back in the day. Um, Long-term, the plan is for there to be, like I said, you know, in the thousands of different satellites that are all orbiting, um, your transceiver or receiver uh, that you would have, say, at your house or at your business, Elon's always compared it. It'll be roughly the size of a pizza box. Um they're saying it's electronically controlled uh, multiple antennas so it's not you know what I always envisioned was a whole bunch of like miniature one inch satellite dishes that were all rotating to, to track individual satellites but it's nothing like that um, he says it's a, a, a phase controlled array of antennas something like that um, I'm not an electrical engineer so I, I'm not going to pretend to know what that means other than there's no moving parts per se um, roughly, what, a, that'd be about 18 inch by 18 inch. Or roughly a half meter by a square uh, shape. Um, but on the first launch, uh, there'd be 60. And he said up to about six launches should provide decent coverage. Um, and because they can build them as fast as they want to and launch them as frequently as I guess they can reuse the rockets for it, um, they should be able to, they haven't given any sort of timeline, but six launches, even if they were to do, say, one a month or one every other month, you're looking somewhere in the next six to 12 months that uh, they'd be starting to roll out some sort of uh, low volume, but not quite prototype volume testing, um, you know, maybe in the, the hundreds of users uh, type time frame. Long term, there's been a whole bunch of different, uh, different plans that they've talked about. One of them was specifically looking at what they wanted to do from having potentially multiple tiers of satellites. Um, and then having individual ground stations that would talk to uh, some of those at a time, but then the satellites would all talk to each other. And so say you had one uplink, um, you know, say somewhere in Virginia or Atlanta or something like that, that that would uplink to one satellite uh, up there, maybe that's in the, the 700 kilometer orbit, that that one would then talk to 20 or 30 that are in the 500 kilometer, um, looking at individual, uh, or talking to individual users on the ground. Um, so it's kind of a, a much higher, say maybe like a 50 to one ratio of uplink to downlink, um, or I guess downlink to uplink if you're going that way. Uh, they have again they haven't really announced any specific plans um, on how they're gonna when they're gonna roll that out um, he did say that for this initial launch uh, they do not have the satellite to satellite links um, which they're I believe they're wanting to do those as laser based versus uh, radio waves communication um, so once that comes online that'll be really interesting for how they can do the satellite to satellite communication um, Let's see, a couple other uh, interesting thoughts. Um, the satellites are currently inside the payload folded up like origami. Uh, so it'll be really interesting as those get deployed, they'll have to open up their wings, if you will, like a butterfly, um, to deploy the solar arrays for power. Um, they are, uh, from a thruster standpoint, each satellite has a, what they call a Hall effect thruster, which I don't know what that means, but it sounds cool. Um, but one thing that's novel about this is instead of using xenon or argon as the, the gas that they use the thruster, they're actually using krypton, which I guess that you know helps provide a uh, perimeter for Superman if he were to ever come here. We kind of have a shield against that. So if Superman was a bad guy, uh, that'd be a good thing. 
um, the uh, on the 60 satellites the combined uh, power uh, you know receiving if you will uh, from all of the solar panels this is actually more than the entire space station collects by you know factor of 1.5 or something like that um, so that's pretty interesting uh, another interesting fact there were they were talking about from a, a latency standpoint that you know right now most of your uh, communication especially long distance happens over fiber optic lines um, which is great because you know there are lasers pulsing inside of a, a glass tube uh, if you will um, however the the speed of light inside of a glass tube is I forget what the number is but you know it's somewhere in the 50% of actual speed of light in a vacuum and so uh, one of the one of the scientists was quoting that you know, you may actually be able to get um, faster from a response, so from a ping time standpoint, communication by going up to space, so say from your house to a satellite, inner satellite to a different one, then to your downlink, it may actually be faster to do that than go through your fiber optic lines. Because um, even though the distance, maybe you're traveling half again further, um, because it's going, you know, twice the speed, you'll have a net of a shorter total travel time uh, for those packets uh, which is pretty interesting so you'll be curious to see how that pans out um, but you know we could be looking by you know the end of 2020 something that some of you guys watching now may be able to take advantage of for your individual uh, internet connectivity whether as a primary as a backup um, so that's something that definitely touches uh, very close to home for a lot of users uh, it helps bring space, I guess, down to uh, something that people can wrap their heads around because it's going to impact them uh, personally. Um, you know, I'm very much uh, a fan of space. Uh, you know, living in Florida, it's convenient for me to go over watch launches uh, and get very excited about uh, that going on. But it's always kind of been this um, something I couldn't really grab onto as personally relevant. Um, it's more, you know, the, the technology uh, and, you know, the science of it is, is very encouraging and, and motivating, but it wasn't something that necessarily directly impacted me in my life. And for the first time in a while, this is something that, you know, individual people could say, you know, I watched this rocket go up, I saw the payload deploy, and I'm currently using that payload to connect to the internet. Um, so, I think that's pretty cool. I think that uh, kind of makes things a lot more relevant for people. So it'll be very interesting to see how this goes. Um, hopefully in the next few months we'll get some more details, um, specifically in terms of time frame um, and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, major kudos to, uh, to the team over at SpaceX thinking outside the box um, and being willing to kind of put themselves out there and develop something new. and. Um, you know of all the various companies that have tried um, there's still some others that are in process but they've all either given up or gone bankrupt in trying so um, wish the best to uh, to Elon and his team and uh, looking forward to an exciting launch uh, tonight thanks for watching